The Infamous series is still one of the most goaded gaming franchises out there. But it sucks to know that after almost nine years, there's still no news on a new game or even a remake. So to remember Infamous, today on Honest Gaming History, we're gonna be going over its full timeline. From Cole's adventures, all the way up to the life of Delson Rowe and Abigail Walker. Also, be sure to stay to the end to hear what I'm gonna cover next for Honest Gaming History. Letting y'all know right now, this next one may be bigger than the God of War video. So, without much further ado, play that intro, son. Cole McGrath was just your everyday bike courier from Empire City, with an unhealthy fondness for parkour. He had friends, hobbies, a life. All the things you need for a video game plot to royally f*** you over. One day on the job, Cole was told to deliver a mysterious package. Like the good courier that he is, he asks no questions and simply does what he is told. While on the job, Cole receives an odd phone call. Of course he answers it, because plot. The dude on the phone instructs him to open the package that he was told to deliver. He denies this person's request because he is the hero of our story. He's a respectable citizen who would never- The guy offers him money. Then he opens it. The package held something called the Ray Sphere. Once Cole opened the package, the Ray Sphere immediately exploded and completely destroyed the historic district of Empire City. Well, this is why you don't touch other people's shit. A few days after the accident, Cole wakes up in the hospital and is greeted by his girlfriend Trish and his best friend Zeke. But Cole feels different. He's not the same bike messenger that he was before the accident. It turns out that the explosion gave him the power to control electricity. Hold up. So you mean this dude opened someone else's property, set off a bomb that destroyed a shit ton of civilians and a huge part of the city, then got blessed with superpowers? That's some old bullshit. Well, things did not only change for him. A plague fell on the majority of the citizens of Empire City. Crime was at an all-time high. People were dying left and right. A criminal group known as the Reapers took this as their chance to take over Empire City and continue to terrorize its people. As a response, the government quarantined the whole city in order to block it off from the rest of the world. As the city was tearing itself apart, Cole began training himself to master his newfound powers. With the help of Zeke, he manages to control it. As Zeke and Cole work together to survive this hell, a mysterious person called the Voice of Survival makes himself known throughout the community via television broadcasts. He lets the people of Empire City know that Cole set off the bomb that caused this whole mess. He is the reason why the city is in shambles. I mean, he's not wrong. Not only was Cole now seen as a terrorist, his girlfriend also left them because her sister was one of the people who died in the race fear explosion. And to think. This could have all been avoided if he just left that package alone. Sick of the bullshit, Cole and Zeke decide to ditch Empire City. With Cole's powers, breaking through the quarantine should be no problem. Well, as cool as it is to control electricity, that power does not make you bulletproof. During their escape, Zeke and Cole are stopped by a wall of machine guns. The person responsible for this barricade was an FBI agent known as Moya. She confronts Cole and begins to give an explanation for all the f***ed up shit that has went down so far. Care to explain, Conscience? So apparently there is something called the Conduit Gene. This is a form of mutation within certain humans that, when activated, grants the whole their superhuman abilities. Like the X-Men. The Ray Sphere is a device that was made to unlock the superhuman abilities of people who have the Conduit Gene. Unfortunately, using this device creates a giant explosion that kills multiple regular human beings in the process, as you've already seen. The Ray Sphere was developed by an organization known as the First Sons. The First Sons were a group of individuals who sought to unlock the hidden potential of human beings through experimentation, so they basically wanted to unlock the powers of anyone with the conduit gene. I hope you got all that. After Moya's much needed explanation, she offers Cole a deal. If he can retrieve the Ray Sphere and find John White, her husband and fellow FBI agent, then she will clear his name and allow him to escape Empire City. With his girlfriend leaving him and the rest of Empire City hating his guts, Cole has no other choice. He accepts Moya's offer and goes on to search for John White. On his quest to find John, he ends up having to deal with the Reapers that we mentioned before, another opposing faction in the city known as the Dustmen, and a mysterious man known as Kessler. Now let me tell you about this asshole named Kessler. As Cole is out here trying to not only find John White, but also make his city a safer place, 
Kessler makes it his mission to just be a thorn in Cole's side. It's not even like he's directly trying to stop Cole from achieving his missions. He just does certain acts that makes Cole's life so much harder. Like helping Cole's enemies escape and showing him visions that easily disorient and confuse him. And he doesn't even give you a reason at first. He just shows up, says some cryptic shit, then dips. Dick Cole. But Cole manages to overcome these obstacles and slowly makes Empire City a little safer through his constant acts of heroism. After a while of doing Moya's dirty work and saving the city, Cole is finally contacted by John White. Cole is like, bro, where have you been? Your wife has been looking all over the place for you. John's like, uh, wife? Cole's like, uh, yeah, Moya, the FBI agent, otherwise known as your wife? John's like, um, I don't know who you're talking about, but I'm a grown ass man. I don't do that marriage shit. Wait, what does being a grown ass man have to do with not getting married? Nigga, just let me read my script. Anyways, it turns out that Moya was lying about John White being her husband. Their goals aren't even the same. She is actually working for DARPA, a US agency responsible for developing new technology for the military. DARPA actually funded the first sons in the creation of the Ray Sphere. Now Moya is using Cole to retrieve the Ray Sphere so DARPA can have it back. That two-timing bitch. You already know Cole left that chick on red. John, on the other hand, knows that the Ray Sphere is too dangerous for human hands, so Cole and John band together to retrieve it and destroy it. With the help of Zeke, they manage to do the impossible and nab the Ray Sphere, but something goes terribly wrong. Zeke has the Ray Sphere in his hands, but he hesitates. Why? Well, just like in this script, Zeke has been completely forgotten. Cole is out here saving the city and gaining all the fame, while Zeke is chilling in the shadow. Zeke wanted to be cool too, he wanted powers. So, he does what any idiotic two-timing supporting character would do. This guy activates the Ray Sphere, knowing full well that it has the potential to eliminate thousands of innocent human beings. Cole, get your boy. Luckily, the Ray Sphere does nothing. Zeke just stands there like, but my powers though. Then Kessler confronts him and tells him that he can fix the problem and give Zeke the power that he so desperately wants. Zeke then looks Cole right in his soul and leaves him to join Kessler. Whose mans is this? Just when you thought Cole couldn't lose anything more, Kessler contacts him again and tells him that he has kidnapped Trish, his ex-girlfriend. Now I know that Trish left Cole because he technically accidentally killed her sister, but in Cole's eyes, that's still his woman. He is gonna do everything he can to save her. Sadly, he was a moment too late. Kessler killed Trish right in Cole's face. Whoa. Kessler went way too far this time. Cole was pissed and he was dead set on destroying the murderer of the only woman he loved. So with the help of John White, they finally managed to nab the Ray Sphere. Cole has had it with this thing. If it wasn't for this device, none of what he went through would have happened. The city would not have been in turmoil. His best friend would not have betrayed him. He would still be with his girlfriend. So with all the anger, hatred, and power that he has left, Cole attempts to smash the Ray Sphere into pieces. But something goes wrong. Of course it does. The Ray Sphere explodes and completely vaporizes John White. Cole is like, well, uh, I destroyed a whole city, got betrayed by an FBI agent and my best friend, watched my ex-girlfriend die in front of my face, and now the only person left that was actually willing to help me is dead. Yup, time to kill Kessler. Cole and Kessler meet up at the location where everything started, the place where the Ray Sphere activated in Cole's hands, Ground Zero. They duke it out, and Cole manages to win. But right before Kessler dies, he lunges at Cole to show him one last vision. This vision shows him the true identity of Kessler. In an alternate past, Kessler was a conduit with a wife and a kid. Everything was peachy till a being known as the Beast showed up. The Beast was a walking nuke, causing destruction wherever it could. Kessler could have used his conduit powers to take it on, but instead, he fled with his family like the bitch ass nigga he is. The Beast ended up getting to Kessler's family anyway, and killed them. So instead of trying to fight the Beast like he should have in the first place, he uses his conduit powers to travel back to the past so he can try and change the future. He takes control of the First Sons, accelerates the race for development process, and does everything he can to make Cole stronger and more ruthless. But why? Why Cole? Why was he so set on making Cole's life a living hell? Because Kessler is Cole. Wait, what? 
Kessler knew that his past self would not be strong enough to take on the beast. So he came back to the past to do everything that he could to make Cole strong enough to take on this monster once it showed up. So... Cole can time travel? What? No! What are you talking about? You're missing the whole point of the twist. No. The point of the twist is that Cole will develop time traveling powers. Ugh. Don't cheat. No. Shut up. Anyways, Cole learns all of this and- So... Cole doesn't learn how to travel through time. No, don't you? <sighs> That's stupid. Fine, continue. Cole takes his information and uses this as his drive to take on the beast in the very close future. A few months later, Cole and Zeke are confronted by NSA agent Lucy Kuo. She knows about the impending doom that is the beast and offers to join Cole and Zeke. She knows of a way to give Cole enough power to take on the beast. But to do this, they have to go to another city called New Marais. Right when Zeke and Cole agree to go to New Marais, the beast appears and attacks Empire City. Cole is like, f*** it, I could just end this plot right now. He attempts to defeat the beast, but ultimately fails and gets knocked out. Silly Cole, short plots are for kids. When Cole wakes up, he finds out that the beast completely destroyed Empire City. They realize that this beast problem has to be dealt with as soon as possible. So they head over to Dr. Sebastian Wolf, a contact of Lucy Quo. Dr. Wolf presents the answer that they need. He develops something called the Rayfield Inhibitor, or RFI for short. This device drains the power of conduits, which will in turn drain the power of the beast. But this is a video game! Taking out the final boss would never be that easy. The Rayfield Inhibitor requires a lot of power to activate. Luckily for our heroes, there are these things called Blast Cores that will supercharge Cole and give him enough power to activate the RFI. So Cole has to go out and collect these Blast Cores so they can charge the RFI and destroy the beast. That'll keep the player busy for a good 5 hours. On his quest, he makes enemies like Bertrand, the leader of the militia that has taken over New Marais. He also meets new allies like Nyx, a fellow conduit who hates Bertrand. Team Cole realizes that they need to take care of Bertrand first, since he's only adding to their issues. Before they manage to take him out, however, he kidnaps Lucy and turns her into a conduit. Don't really see how that makes Team Cole weaker, but okay. Thanks, Bertrand. Later on in his quest, Cole runs into a familiar face. It's John, remember? The asshole that got vaporized by the race fair a while back. Well, it turns out that this incident actually activated his powers given to him by his conduit gene. John explains to Cole that the plague that fell on the citizens of Empire City because of the race fear explosion will destroy the human race. The conduits are the only beings that will survive, so the best idea is to wipe out the human race to activate the powers of all the conduits. John then shows Cole his powers, Cole puts two and two together, and concludes that John is the beast. I knew I hated that nigga for a reason. Cole presents his new information to his crew, and they immediately split apart. Lucy's trifling ass sides with the beast, because if the RFI does go off, all the conduits will die in exchange for the lives of the regular people. Lucy wants to live. Nick sides with Cole and Zeke because she knows that the beast needs to die. Like, today. Lucy, in a fit, leaves Team Cole to join the beast. The rest of the team prepare for their final battle. Oh shit, hold up, hold up. We forgot about Bertrand. So before Cole tells his crew about the whole John thing, they confront Bertrand and the militia one last time. It turns out that Bertrand, as much as he hates conduits, is actually a conduit himself. He turns into some mutant Godzilla thing and battles Team Cole. They defeat Bertrand and put the rest of their focus into the beast problem. Alright, so with their plan finally made, Cole says his goodbyes to Zeke. These guys have rekindled their friendship since the whole Kessler incident, and Cole knows that the RFI will kill him. So this is a very emotional moment for both friends. With the power of all the blast cores stored within Cole, our heroes confront the beast for one last time. After a long, grueling battle, Cole activates the RFI and witnesses the beast die. As promised, the device heals all the regular people that were affected by the plague. But the majority of the conduit population died, including Cole. Zeke, completely torn by his friend's sacrifice, takes his dead companion in his arms and they leave New Marais together. Well, not really together, cause Cole is kinda dead. Yeah. The end. So, since it's been a minute since we covered an infamous story, here's a little background info. In this world, there are gifted human beings known as conduits. These guys are able to manipulate unique forms of matter. Like the realest conduit of them all, Cole, who was able to manipulate electricity, among other things. But you know how the world gets when people start doing stuff that can't be explained. Regular folks start wiling out. 
After the events of Infamous 2, these conduits were renamed Bioterrorists. And the Department of Unified Protection, aka DUP, aka Duke, was formed to round up all the terrorists for the better good. After all the conduits were round up, because they're not terrorists, the military decided to take over the whole conduit detainment operation. So now the DUP is being phased out. Enter Delson Rowe, the master graffiti artist and self-proclaimed criminal mastermind. Delson is a Native American from the fictional Okomish tribe, so don't go looking it up. The only family he has left is his brother Reggie, who just so happens to be the sheriff, which makes it kind of hard for Delson to partake in his criminal mastermind tactics. After getting another lecture from his brother about tagging, Delson and Reggie witness a crazy military truck crash. This truck contained three conduits, Hank, Abigail, and Eugene. Delson's curious ass decides to take a casual stroll to the accident because there's absolutely nothing sketchy about a freaking military truck crashing. Nah, for real, like my boy could have avoided the whole situation and it would have made complete sense. But I guess some people just can't resist the crazy shit. The only conduit left in the crash is Hank. So Delson tries to do the heroic thing by helping him out. But his heroic act immediately backfires. After Reggie tries to get involved, Hank straight up holds Delson hostage. You see why sometimes it's better to just leave shit alone? Well, good thing he didn't leave the shit alone. Hank activates his powers and Delson tries to stop him. But instead of just stopping him, he absorbs the dude's powers. So now Delson is able to manipulate and absorb smoke. Just like Hank can. And just like that, Delson becomes a terrorist. They're conduits, not terrorists. Fine, conduits, damn. Delson is hella confused about what's going on, and Reggie's not helping, because he immediately starts treating Delson like someone with the coronavirus. So Delson does the only thing he can do. He goes to find Hank to figure out what the hell is going on. But the Hank chase throws him right into the arms of Brooke Augustine, the leader of the DUP who also happens to be a conduit. Wait. Who hired you? Brooke is able to manipulate concrete, and though that may sound boring as hell, it's actually hella painful. Delson sees Brooke interrogating Hank and is like, I'm not trying to get arrested, so he plays it cool. But Augustine thinks that Hank might have told him some conduit secrets. I'm sorry, what? Like, what was Hank gonna tell this random ass kid that he just met? He doesn't even know him. Like, Augustine, you out here wildin' right now. So after Delson dismisses Augustine's assumptions, the dumbass is like, oh, well, it's kind of funny because aren't you a terrorist too? You are really dumb, for real. So Augustine gets curious and starts torturing my guy with her concrete powers. But Delson is still keeping his mouth shut about what went down. I'm not telling you about my newfound powers, lady. So this nice lady from the Okomish tribe named Betty tries to defend Delson. But Augustine uses this chance to finally break Delson and threatens Betty and the rest of the tribe. So Delson tells her the truth and admits that he somehow caught Hank's conduit powers. But the bitch doesn't believe him and accuses him of lying. So she knocks him out. He wakes up to find the rest of his friends hurt, but no one is getting any better. I mean, one doesn't just heal from getting shanked by concrete. So Delson correctly assumes he has the ability to absorb powers, grabs Reggie and tells him that they need to go to the DUP's base in Seattle, find Augustine, then snatch her powers. Reggie is like, huh? But what are you really gonna do? Delson has powers and you don't. Just follow through. So Delson and Reggie make it to Seattle and immediately start messing with the DUP. They ran around town, slowly limiting their vision around the area. Then after some time foiling the dupes' plans, they hear about a conduit serial killer rolling around the streets of Seattle. The brothers are like, well, can't have that. So they go look for the killer. They find out the killer is a girl who only seems to be after drug dealers. Her name is Abigail. She's able to manipulate Neon and she just so happens to be one of the conduits who escaped from that car accident in the beginning of the game. Delson confronts her, they tussle, the Delson touches her and absorbs her Neon powers. And in the process, he gets a look into her past and finds out why she's out here murdering drug dealers. We can't go too in depth with her right now because we're probably gonna talk about her in a future episode of Honest Gaming History, but just know that drug dealers are the reason why her brother got killed. After Delson violates her mind, Reggie gets all crazy and tries to arrest her. Oh, I forgot to mention, Reggie has a bit of a problem with conduits. Like I already told you how he started treating Delson like he had the coronavirus, but he continues to remind Delson that these powers are not a gift, but a curse. Like my guy, that's your bro. How are you gonna treat him different just because he has powers now? So if you're wondering why Reggie was so ready to throw this girl in the slammer, it's partially because he's low key racist towards conduits. And honestly guys, fuck Reggie. So Delson defends Abigail because she's only taking down drug dealers. I mean, technically you shouldn't be out here killing people in the first place, but you know, Reggie can still chill out for a sec. After seeing that his pleas to free her weren't working, Delson gets smart about this. He says that she would be his responsibility and she could help him take down the DUP. Reggie accepts, she accepts, and they form the Fuck the DUP squad. Together, Abigail and Delson continue to make Seattle a better place by continuing to destroy the DUP's hold on it and getting rid of drugs in the street. Oh, and Abigail starts crushing hard on Delson. It's adorable, but hella awkward. After some more time, Delson finally confronts Augustine. After she figures out that he somehow got a second power, my man Delson dead asks if he can leech her powers. She's like, 
You just want me to give you my powers? And he's like, I mean, would it help if I said please? Augustine gets tight, the traps him in concrete. But just when the bad guy's about to win, a random ass angel thing appears and snatches Delson. After he gets dropped off, he gets contacted by some dude named Eugene, who claims that he is a huge fan of Delson. They work together to try and stop a DUP convoy containing a whole bunch of civilians who are suspected of being conduits. But a damaged helicopter slaps Delson right in the face during the rescue. The impact knocks him out for a bit. Then after he wakes up, the suspected civilians are gone. Racist ass Reggie helps him find where the civilians are being held. Delson fights a big ass angel named He Who Dwells. Then he runs to the conduit who took all the civilians and is responsible for all the weird angels he's been seeing. Delson does his power absorption slash mind rape thing. Turns out that this mystery dude is Eugene, and he just so happens to be the third and final conduit who escaped that car crash. Eugene was just your average nerd who got bullied nonstop. One day those bullies drove him too far and he realized he was a conduit who could summon angels and demons. Jesus Christ. The DUP captured him and detained him for six years, forcing him to use and learn his powers. Now he's a conduit freedom fighter just like Delson and Abigail. He didn't capture those civilians for bad reasons, he just wanted to help them escape the clutches of the DUP. But you know Reggie, this bum immediately assumes that my boy Eugene is a threat. Leave the kid alone, bruh. Delson defends the conduit and calls Reggie out on his racist bullshit. Reggie accepts his wishes, then Delson tries to convince Eugene to join the good fight. Eugene starts off too scared to leave his conduit cave, but eventually decides to help out the fuck the DUP squad. Oh, and Delson now has the power to summon angels and demons too. He was already kind of broken, but now he's like a smoke wielding, neon shooting, angel summoning Jesus. Later, Delson finds out that Hank, the guy that Delson snatched his smoke powers from, is out here rampaging around the streets, making him look bad. Delson decides to confront Hank so he could also join the fuck the DUP squad. I mean, he's already out here killing dupe soldiers, so he might as well. Hank puts their pass aside and joins Delson in his band of rogue conduits. Hank informs Delson that both Eugene and Abigail were captured by the DUP, so they group up with Reggie to save the captured conduits. But just like I'm sure you guys assume when they decided to join forces, Hank can't be trusted. Turns out the smoking ball sack was working for Augustine this whole time. So the concrete queen gets a jump on Delson and captures him. But Reggie shows up with a freaking rocket launcher and blasts Augustine. Augustine. All right, Reggie, maybe you're not so bad after all. But then Augustine gets tight and kills Reggie. Damn, just now starting to like the guy. So Delson rages the hell out and gets in a full on superpower fight with Augustine. The battle gets so wild that the island they're on collapses. Delson wakes up after the island's collapse and immediately chases the prick who betrayed him, Hank. He finds him and discovers that the DUP has Hank's daughter. That's why he pulled that dick move before. Delson spares a guy because he ain't worth it. Then he sets his sights on Augustine. He regroups with the rest of his super friends and they storm Augustine's base. Once he confronts her, he finds out that Augustine actually set up that whole crash in the beginning of the game. Augustine has been capturing conduits to protect them from the mobs who are after them. That's noble, I guess, in a really twisted and messed up way. Augustine then confides in Delson and actually tries to reason with the dude. She even has the gall to try and convince him to join her. Delson dubs her shit and they fight with Delson standing victorious. Delson absorbs her powers and does his whole I'm gonna look into your past thing. Turns out that Augustine used to be from the military. Seven years ago, the military was at war with the conduits and she ended up getting turned into one. With her conduit powers active and the world in complete chaos due to the fear of conduits, Augustine decides to be the one to protect the conduits in her own twisted way by capturing them. I mean, you had good intentions, lady, but you can't just be out here capturing people, bruh. Unless she made like an Xavier school for the gifted, but for conduits. Now that I can get behind. So Augustine gets up and refuses to let Delson free all the conduits she captured. They fight again and Delson wins, again, using her own power against her. That's some pretty gangster shit. With Augustine down, the fuck the DUP squad take down the DUP, expose Augustine for the twisted conduit that she is, then free all the conduits who were captured. With Augustine's powers, he heals the rest of the Akomas tribe and spray paints the same billboard he did in the beginning of the game with a memorial for his brother. And with that, the story of Delson Bannerman Rowe comes to a sad but very fulfilling end. Honestly, this was a really good story. I kind of wish there was more reasoning as to how the humans just stop being scared of the conduits, but you know, every story has its faults. Either way, Delson is a dope ass character with some dope ass powers. I see why you guys wanted me to cover him so bad. In this world, there are these superhuman beings called, you know what, you guys heard all this already. Long story short, there are these guys called conduits. They can control unique forms of matter, but society doesn't like weird stuff. So the DUP was formed to capture these conduits. Pretty much all the background info you need. 
Enter the focus of today's story, Abigail Walker, who was given the nickname Fetch at a young age but never explains why. Fetch grew up with her mother, father, and older brother, Brent. Everything was chill with the family until Abigail went to discover that she was a conduit. Her parents lost their shit, like regular folks tend to do these situations, and make an executive decision to call the authorities. How you gonna snitch on your own daughter, bro? Brent is like, well, can't have that, then runs away with his little sister. During their time on the road, Brent has Abigail promise that she won't use her powers. Makes sense, I mean, if her own parents snitched on her, imagine what a stranger would do. Oh, you a conduit? Fuck your rights. I'm calling the cops. Well, the cops might have been the better option because the siblings end up getting hooked on drugs. Okay, I just gotta say, Toy Sucker Push for making this backstory super realistic. It sucks to say, but getting introduced to, then addicted to drugs, is very likely to happen when you're young, homeless, and just looking for something to give you comfort. I'm in no way, shape, or form saying that drug addiction is cool or entertaining to watch, but I am happy that Sucker Punch on the dark side of society, just like this, so the people playing can more so understand that drug addiction just ain't it. Now, if you're old enough, responsible, and just smoking that ganja, go ahead and do your thing. Just don't go overboard with it. So Brent eventually joins a gang so they can survive in these streets, and ends up dropping his whole drug use problem because drug addiction is not cool. Fetch originally sticks with her drugs, but ends up dropping them after seeing her brother return from a job all banged up. Over time, they make it to Seattle, where everything gets fucked. The siblings get a hold of a boat and plan on running away with money from an opposing gang, the Acurans. Fetch is sent to fetch the money, but the Acurans find out about this plan and kidnap her brother. I mean, what did you expect? One does not simply steal from a bunch of freaking criminals. Fetch is like, well, can't have that, so searches all over for her brother, but to no avail. Eventually, she's found by Shane, Brent's boss and the drug lord who is trying to take down the Acurans. This creepy ass dude from Texas doesn't waste a second before he starts hitting on this poor girl who just lost her brother. So fun fact, Shane's voice actor, Travis Willingham, just so happened to be the same voice actor for Reggie in Infamous Second Son. And the voice actor for Fetch, Laura Bailey, is actually his wife. Meaning two of the characters who treated Fetch the worst were voiced by the voice actor's own husband. Those conversations after each recording must have been hilarious. Oh, and Laura Bailey also voiced Kid Chunks from DBZ, so she gets some Gucci points for that. So Shane decides to be useful and offers to help Fetch find her brother. Fetch accepts the help without knowing what Shane's true intentions are. I came looking for booty. As they go on a multitude of missions to try and find Brent, it becomes apparent that Shane is using Abigail's power to achieve his goal of taking down the Acurans. Without them, he can own the drug trade on these Seattle streets. His intentions become 100% clear once they find Brent. Instead of kindly giving Brent back to fetch, this dickhead takes him hostage. Ha! <laughs> Got him! <laughs> Shane wants Fetch to work for him permanently as his weapon of mass destruction. Once Shane uses her to get the police under his thumb, he tricks Fetch again and almost kills her. Come on, Fetch! That's twice he tricked you now. Do better, girl. Pissed, Fetch gives Shane a new choice. Either he hands over her brother or she will pick apart his gang piece by piece. Shane acts all tough, but his refusal to comply causes him to lose a bunch of men thanks to Fetch. Why would you mess with the conduit as a normal ass human? They don't play by our rules. You put up your hands to fight and they obliterate you. Like, why would you even start that war? So Shane's bitch ass bitches up and agrees to meet Fetch so she can have her brother back. But instead of getting her brother, Shane tricks the poor girl again and injects her with drugs. Fetch, come on girl again. You're killing me here, bruh. So the drugs disorient Fetch and lead her to accidentally kill her brother. <laughs> this is why you can't be falling for the schemes, bruh. By this point, the DUP has been on her ass for a minute, so they arrest her and send her to their prison in Curtin K. Over the next two years, Augustine trains Abigail to master her powers. Not really in a calm Master Roshi type of way, but more like an Akuma, you gotta kill everything type of way. And to help her train, Eugene from Infamous Second Son is used to create enemies for her to face. So that's a nice little fun fact. Not that nice for Eugene since he was being forced to do shit he didn't want to, but you know. Once Fetch tells Augustine the full story of her past, the Concrete Queen asks Fetch if she would kill Shane if given the chance. Then the lady reveals that they have the ball sack as a prisoner this whole time. Damn, son. All jokes aside, I'd be scared if I was this dude. My man kidnapped her brother, used her to take down a gang, had her kill police officers, and led her to kill her brother. Body is not the word to describe what's about to happen to you, my G. Fetch sees Shane, rages the hell out, and attacks. But she misses, 
How? How did you miss? In the confusion, Shane tries to escape the prison, but Fetch confronts him. Shane starts talking his shit, then Fetch tortures him before ultimately killing him. Told you guys this dude was gonna catch the hands. With Fetch's biggest adversary down, Augustine states that she is ready. She's then put in a military truck with Eugene and Hank, who is also from Infamous Second Son. See how everything ties together? Hank's sly ass reveals that he has a paperclip to unlock the cuffs. Which leads to Hank creating the accident that happened in the beginning of Infamous Second Son. But as you know, this is all staged by Augustine. And after that, we get into the events of Infamous Second Son, which was already covered in detail in this video. So you guys should watch that. Long story short, Fetch goes back to Seattle and starts killing drug dealers to avenge her brother. Delson finds her, they take down drug suppliers in Seattle, they hook up, then she helps him take down the DUP and free the rest of the conduits sent to Kurt and Kay. But if you want a more detailed explanation, then yeah, you should probably watch that Delson Row video. It's pretty good. And with that, end slate. Y'all, thank you so much for watching another Honest Gaming History compilation video. I'm really glad you guys enjoyed. It's an easy way for me to make one bite-sized video, combining all the spread out lore videos that I did in the past. Don't forget to like the video if you enjoy it, comment whoever you want me to cover next in Honest Gaming History, subscribe if you want to see more of me, and hit that bell if you want to stay notified of whenever I upload new content. And now, for the moment you've all been waiting for. Next time on Honest Gaming History. We are finally getting into Legend of Zelda. We are covering the whole Legend of Zelda timeline. And by the time this video comes out, Tears of the Kingdom or Breath of the Wild 2 should be out too. So that will be included in the video. So it's going to be a lot, which is why I was saying it's probably going to be bigger than the God of War video. So I'm hype. I hope you guys are hype. I know a bunch of you guys have been asking for this for a while. And surprisingly, once again, I am so so excited to make sense of this timeline. I've already looked into it a little bit and it's not as complicated as I thought, but with that, we'll leave it there. Shout out to the patrons. Thank you guys so much for all your support. Without you guys, I would not be able to make content like this. And if you want to become a patron and get amazing perks like watching Honest Gaming History before everybody else, check out my Patreon link in the description below. But with all that being said, folks, be easy, stay lit, stay healthy out there. Black Lives Matter and don't forget, you can do whatever the hell you put your mind to. All it takes is practice and time. Peace out, y'all.